Hey everyone, it's Blake, and welcome in to the 411 on Wrestling Podcast. On today's episode of the podcast, we welcome back our friend Andrew Thompson from Post Wrestling to discuss WWE Survivor Series on Sunday and preview all the matchups and make our predictions for every single match on the card. We also uh, go through some thoughts on The Undertaker and uh, share our rankings on The Undertaker's top five opponents throughout his career. Uh, That was fun to do, but it was also fun to really uh, take a dive into what is going on in WWE right now in terms of uh, the build to Survivor Series, all the different potential scenarios that could play out in these elimination matches and in the champion versus champion matches, which will obviously be headlined by Roman Reigns versus Drew McIntyre in the main event. Uh, So always a great discussion with Andrew and uh, just really great insight uh, into everything going on uh, right now in the bill to Survivor Series and what we could see at Survivor Series on Sunday. So let's go ahead and jump into the conversation with Post Wrestling's Andrew Thompson. All right, as promised, uh, our guest today is Andrew Thompson. Of course, we had Andrew on the podcast a couple months ago and uh, excited to welcome him back. Uh, Andrew, thanks for joining as always. And I know you're a very busy man right now at uh, Post Wrestling. Uh, Congratulations here to John Pollock as he is uh, welcoming another little one into the world. But uh, that has made you a busy man here for a little while, hasn't it? Yeah, uh, firstly, of course, you know, got to send the congratulations out to John on the on, on the addition to the family. But Blake, thank you for having me on the podcast again, man. It was great last time we did it, and I'm sure it's going to be a, another great one, man. Well, you know, a lot's happened since the last time we uh, we <laughs> talked. That was, I was going to say, that's probably the second week of September, and uh, we were talking about sort of the state of WWE, and we were talking about the big Bailey and, and Sasha and, and kind of where everything stood then. But, man, uh, things have really – there's been a lot going on since then, and that obviously leads us into – what we're going to talk about for the majority of the show, and that's going to be Survivor Series. Uh, a little bit later, we'll, we'll kind of run through our, our Undertaker opponents, which I kind of teased in the intro, uh, running down our, our favorite uh, opponents for the Undertaker uh, throughout the years. But uh, let's talk a little bit about Survivor Series, because this is kind of shaped up to be an interesting card, I guess, Andrew. I mean, we know we kind of have the champion versus champion matches, uh, the traditional Survivor Series matches, they are what they are. Um, as many people have pointed out, I think having the draft where they have the draft, just it just completely throws everything out of whack uh, in terms mm-hmm. of this brand loyalty and all this stuff. But uh, what, what have you kind of thought, just I guess before we get into each of these matches, what have you thought maybe about the WWE here over the past month or so as, as they've started this build to Survivor Series? I, I feel like this build specifically has been a, uh, a, 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 a an interesting want to say the least like I, I i don't know what it is but i always like th- th- this idea of like brand versus brand thing i always felt like they should have got rid of this for survivor series a couple years ago like i always I, I missed the old format like they used to have back in 2005 like when it would be like a wwe championship match on the show a world championship match a u.s title match and like you would get the the traditional survivor series matches or just uh, you know one, like one, one or two of those and I, I i like the whole champion versus champion thing like I think it does have its benefits, like even though I, I I wish they would just revert back to the old format for Survivor Series and kind of save the, you know, the champion versus champion thing for a pay-per-view like Clash of Champions. Right. Like I think that's more more, more fitting. But, you know, I, I can't complain about it because we have gotten some really good matches out of these, uh you know, these these themed Survivor Series like Daniel Bryan versus Brock. That was like a really solid one. You had a, that the, the, the ending to... um. Last year's men's uh, Survivor Series <laughs> match when when Keith Lee just went on the the elimination rampage, man. Everybody thought he was gonna pin Roman. Like that was crazy <laughs> good. You can look back at AJ versus Brock. Like it, I, I think this this theme of Survivor Series has really brought us like a lot of really good matches. But you know the whole uh, champions versus champions thing every year when you have a pay per view called Classic Champions that you can run that on is kind of it's kind of eh. Yeah, I'm with you. I think, um, you know, if you're going to do Survivor Series, uh, I guess just either do the whole thing like they used to, where you just do all the traditional Survivor Series matches, knowing that you can kind of twist things in and tie in different storylines and all those matches, or just make it, like you said, sort of a, a little bit different than just doing this many champion versus champion matches. But you mentioned Keith Lee. Let, let's start with this, uh, the men's Survivor <laughs> Series match here, because... This is an interesting one, and we talk about sort of the draft and, you know, this brand uh, loyalty and all this stuff. That's where I think it really comes in when you talk about, you know, this men's match, and then, I mean, you can even say the same for the women's match, I guess, but 
it, the thing is, is and we kind of laughed about this. I, I remember back when we, we did the podcast a couple months ago, we're like, man, I, I couldn't even tell you who's on what brand. Like, I don't even know who's here, who's there. And, you know, I mean, we'll get to this later, but, you know, we just had Drew McIntyre and just all of a sudden he's on Smack. Like, where did this even come from? And so, um, again, I think that's the thing is you would be better off, in my opinion, just saying, okay, we're going to put these four guys and you can call the team name, whatever, like Team AJ or – versus, you know, Team Raw, whatever you want to call it. But, like, Team Raw versus Team SmackDown means nothing uh, just because, right. you know, these guys are have basically just interchanged. But we do have uh, Team Raw, which is Keith Lee, AJ Styles, Sheamus, Braun Strowman, and Riddle, not Matt Riddle, not Matthew Riddle, just Riddle, uh, versus <laughs> the Team SmackDown, which is going to be uh, Seth Rollins, Jey Uso, Kevin Owens, King Corbin, and then one more to be decided. Now, we're recording this before SmackDown on Friday night, it seems like mm. Big E is the popular pick, although I yeah. did see you know, a report. It was from uh, Fightful. Uh, they said that Otis was apparently in consideration. I think we know which one most people are probably going to be voting for on that one. Um, I think yeah. Big E is probably going to be the one that, that most want to see in that spot. Um, overall oh, thoughts you- just on this match, I guess, Andrew, because this is this is an interesting one. Yeah, you, you know what? Like you literally just said something that kind of like sparked an idea in my head. So uh, obviously we uh, we've seen over the past uh, several weeks on, on SmackDown when you know Jay Uso has kind of in- inserted himself in Roman Reigns' issues yeah. and kind of like put himself at the forefront of that. Like we've seen that with uh, Kevin Owens. We've recently seen it with Daniel Bryan. You know, as you mentioned, we're recording this before SmackDown. Jay Uso is going to be facing Daniel Bryan on this uh, eleven twenty episode of SmackDown. So and I, I was thinking, I was like, so if Biggie is inserted into this Survivor Series match. And and, and what I'm thinking overall is going to happen, I'm thinking Jey Uso is probably going to get fed up with Kevin Owens doing the match, and that's going to be a way for them to have Team SmackDown lose this match. But I was thinking maybe more so, maybe this could be our way to get Big E versus Roman set up, possibly. Like yep. maybe Jey Uso could start something with Big E doing the match, and then, you know, that obviously carries over to the following week on SmackDown, and WWE can handle it you know, how they may. But I, I think this might be a good idea. You know, it might be a way for, you know, Big E to kind of, you know, him him going at Jey Uso will ultimately ha- end up having him, you know, clashing with Roman Reigns in some form or fashion. Yeah, I could see that too. And and I was going to say, if we're we're going to make our predictions on all these matches, I'm actually going to take Team Raw here. I, I'm going to yeah. go with, <laughs> with that group. Um, because like you said, I think there's more... There's more options in terms of what you can do, I think, with with SmackDown in terms of finding ways for them to lose. Like you said, if you tie in a Big E and Jey Uso thing, like they can somehow, you know, basically have not not be on the same page and that can cause them to lose. And then I think you also tie in, you know, the reports which suggest that, you know, Seth Rollins could be out for a while here because, you know, Becky Lynch is about to have, yeah. you know, her her child. And so there's really, you know, is there really any reason for him to win? And then, of course, you have King Corbin on the team. And so, um, you know, mm-hmm. I, I just that in and of itself, like I just I think the the raw team is obviously stronger. And while they have their own, you know, all those guys are probably going to be in feuds together here moving forward in some form or fashion. I just think that they're probably the better pick in this one. So, so Blake, I did want to ask you, like specifically speaking on team raw, like is it just me or are you noticing it like like? Sheamus has had like some really really good matches like over the past month yeah. or two or whatever how long since he's been on Raw like I don't know if that was just me but I was like I was like when I was thinking about some of the matches that he's had I was like all of his matches have been like really really good like Sheamus is kind of like in his like in his little stride thing and I think that's going to end up like I think by the powers that be seeing him like perform in the ring like that it might kind of you know ease their minds as far as like okay maybe we can do the drew mcintyre Sheamus thing like yeah that's what i just what i was thinking yeah and i was gonna say that too like i think at this point i mean you know you can watch just the weekly and you kind of see what's been going on with those two i think that's an obvious one they want to try to get to um because again too the way i think of it is like you're gonna do this roman and drew match which we'll talk about in a bit but it's like what's next after you do that because you're not gonna go right back to that like the the obvious expectation i think with that match is that we're gonna potentially see that again at wrestlemania like that would be my guess Mm. um but it's like where do you go from here with drew and that's where you know if you look at the raw side it's like you're not gonna do drew versus Strowman. like i nothing against braun Strowman, but it's just like i don't think that's a fresh sort of situation probably right now 
I mean, you could you, obviously you could probably do Drew and AJ. I think that's one that would be interesting uh, for a bit. I mean, Drew versus Keith Lee. We've seen that already, not in a championship form, but like they just I don't think they've done enough with Keith Lee. So I think the Sheamus thing has to be put in there at some point, and maybe that's kind of your next big match as you go towards you know the Rumble, and then you go back to maybe Drew and Reigns at WrestleMania. I don't know if that makes sense, but I, I no, feel like that's does. that's maybe the best pathway moving forward. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you on that. Like, and uh, one, one thing I did also want to talk to you about, because I remember we kind of slightly touched on this uh, the last time we did the podcast back in September. But we talked about Braun Strowman a little bit and like just kind of seeing like the, the 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 career of Braun Strowman from 2017 to now. And I know you remember, Blake, back in 2017, Braun Strowman was hot. Red like, hot. <laughs> no, red hot. Like, dude, like I, I think we all can agree that. If there was ever a time where you was gonna put the world title on that dude, it should have been it should have been then. Like yeah. he should he should, he I think he should have won the title. And, may, and maybe they thought that he wasn't ready, but I'm like, dude, the crowd wanted it, man. Like they 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 want and like just to see where he is now, he's like such an afterthought, and it, and it's crazy. And I was just wondering, did you kind of feel the same way about Strowman? Like when you see him, it's like just eh, like you know, just eh. And see, and that's the thing too is like even like and this is a different situation, but. Like, think about the Daniel Bryan thing. Like, when he got hot and he finally got that, like, it was sort of like, it was great and, and it was wonderful, but it was almost like, okay, well, they didn't really know what to do next with that. And, of course, he got injured and everything, and then when he came back, you know, obviously people were all into it, but they weren't to the levels they were before because it, it wasn't something that just sort of was in that zone of just feeling so natural. Everything just came together and clicked, and I thought that's where he was at, like you said, back in 2017, where everything like at every turn you're like oh my goodness this is the next step and then we're going to the next step like now is the time to do it and then when they didn't do it it's like well i mean what you just all of a sudden you just turn the other way you're like well we know they're not going to do it and they just keep <laughs> doing these things that don't feel special and you're just making him just another guy and and i think if they would have did that with daniel bryan you know as we were talking about like if you go back to to that whenever that was was it 2014 or, or whatever and mm -hmm. it's like if they had decided not to do that with him and just kind of said, all right, we're sticking to our guns here. We're going to do Batista, you know, and, and kind of go that route. Then I think it would have been the same thing. Like you would have had the same situation where, you know, Daniel Bryan, maybe not have recovered from that, even as talented performer he is, because I think it's once people latch on, I think once fans latch on to someone and they just, like you said, be red hot, like this guy, Strowman was just at the top of his game. Yes. But, you know, now it's like he wins the title this year at WrestleMania, basically the third wheel, like out of it, the Roman. It was too late, man. Yeah, it's it just too late. late. And, and, and I think, too, it's, I don't, like he, I don't want to say the word exposed because I don't think he's been exposed, but I just think that they have not done things now that, they did much better in that build in 2017 where it's like they put him in those spots to where, you know, you could, you could easily root for him and you could easily see him saying, okay, we, we want this guy to win the title. But now it's like, okay, we've seen him win the universal championship. And it's like, like, do we really want to see this? Cause we know kind of what the runs <laughs> look like. Right. And I think right. that's the biggest problem right now with him. Right now. I agree with that, man. Like it's, it's just like, like, Strowman, like, and you kind of hit the nail on the head. I don't really think I need to elaborate more than that, but like, I'm gonna just piggyback on what you said. It's like they they just waited too long, man. Like they should have pulled yeah. the trigger back in 2017 when he was like, like, dude, dude literally got over just by beating Roman Reigns. Like, literally, that's all people cared. Like, they wanted to see him beat Roman Reigns, and then he took that into the Brock feud, and then people were like, okay, he's just like this red hat dude. So like, it's no way that he's about to lose a Brock. Like the way they built Strowman. Like I like I, I remember during that period. No, they had Strowman like he was like he was like in this position to where like they, they were doing like these little things where they could see how long people could last in a match with him. Right. Like and and people were in it. Like they were fully invested in it. And it was just crazy to me seeing how like the trajectory the, the career trajectory that he's had. And like the and, and, and I don't think it I I think it also hurt him the the many opportunities that he had at the world title and he lost. Like it was the the, the no mercy match. Uh it was that 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 prior month when he lost that fatal four way with Brock, Joe, and Roman, yep. um, and then he lost at the Rumble, and then he lost that Crown Jewel, and then he had the Money in the Bank, and then like he had that weird moment at SummerSlam 2018 <laughs> when he kind of just like looked at them while they was in the ring and like he didn't cash in. Everybody was like, "Dude, like why, why wouldn't the character like you know what I'm saying? Like that makes no sense. You sitting there like why would you not 
take that chance. So it, it, it is. I, I think the Braun Strowman character is right now is what he will forever be, like for yeah. as long as he's in WWE. Like I can't see him being a like top world champion anymore. Yeah, and I think Roman coming back like he did. Did oh, not yeah. <laughs> help at all. Like if Roman had came back in his previous sort of iteration, where like everyone, like he's the same character, he hasn't changed. Then I think you could have looked at Braun and said, okay, well we still maybe prefer this guy over Roman in this in that form. But now it's like you, you can, there's no comparison. And, and again, I, I don't that that's not to speak badly about Braun. I, I just think that they have not done him any favors. And you know now you've got guys over there like you said, Sheamus, who's kind of had a resurgence. You've got Keith Lee, who hopefully is going to get you know some type of bigger opportunity. And and I think Braun's just kind of settled into that. I don't want to say he's the big show or Kane, but like I feel like he's kind of settled into that role oh, yeah. where that's where that's where you're going, bro. Yeah, I'm telling you, that's where you're going. <laughs> he's just the monster, and I think you know that they probably don't put him in that spot to where it's like they view him as the champion right now because he did have that run here this year. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Are you going? You're going with Team Raw too, I assume. Yeah, I'm going with Team Raw. All right, there you go. We're both going Team Raw on this one. All right, let's go to the women's match. I don't think we'll spend as much time on this one, and this is not to knock any of the ladies, but, boy, the build of this one's been interesting. Um, Team Raw, Shayna Baszler, Nia Jax, Lacey Evans, Peyton Royce, Lana versus Team SmackDown, which is uh, Bianca Belair, Ruby Riot, Liv Morgan, and two that have still not been announced. Uh, again, the reports, uh, Fightful seem to suggest Bailey and Natalia may be the two that are added here. Um, I don't know. This is another one where, I mean, this, the, the bill to this one, you talk about interesting. I mean, everyone's talking about Lana here and getting put mm-hmm. through the table and as many times. And I assume, I, you know, are we going to get number 10 properly on Sunday? My guess is probably yes. Um, I just, this whole thing, is just makes me laugh, but I am actually going to, I don't even know who the other two are on SmackDown here, but I guess if I'm picking Raw in the men's match, like it's almost like, you know, SmackDown's going to have to win the women's one. Uh, So I may actually go with the SmackDown side here, even though I feel like there's something about this Raw team where it's, you know, you've got the champions over there and and Shayna and Nia um and then you know Lana who who knows where this thing's headed but uh I'm gonna, I'm, I'm going to go with SmackDown not knowing even who the other two are but I don't know man they've this has been another one that's just like I don't know how you just can get fully invested in this because you're looking around saying okay Peyton Royce is here. Why in the world did they ever break up, you know, the Iconics? Um yeah. what they what they're doing with Lana, this Baszler, Nia Jax team like it's it's been something, but obviously it's not been anything just game changing. And then you look on the other side and it's like, you know, Liv Morgan's kind of having a resurgence here. Bianca Belair, like she feels like the next sort of it thing. Um, and so I, I don't know, this is, this is a tough one to call, but I'm, I'm at least interested in this one and maybe not for all the right reasons, just in terms of the build has been kind of wacky. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, it, it should be a decent match. So I'm, I'm going to roll with, uh, SmackDown on this one, but I, I, I'm not gonna lie. The Lana thing that they've been doing on TV for the past nine or eight weeks, I'm, I'm, I'm in, <laughs> I'm in. I'm telling because like I, I, I genuinely think that they, that she's gonna be the soul, that she, she's going, she's not gonna be the soul survivor, but she's going to be the last one left on right. Team Raw, and I, and I think that's what they build into because like, it, it but like if they're not building to that, and then they got the Chronicle coming out about her tomorrow, yeah. I think. Like if they're not building to the to like Lana being the sole survivor after everything that she's been through on TV over the past month and a half, like it, it, it'll be all for nothing. Like it legit. And you you, you want to know how I think it's gonna happen, Blake? I'm telling you. Remember, remember I said this. <laughs> Nia Jax is gonna put her through a table. She's gonna be knocked out for the whole match, and then she will come back and be yep. the last one left. I'm tell I'm telling you. She's gonna do the like, Santino. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'm telling you. That's it. That's exactly what's gonna happen. But like just like and uh, of course we'd be remiss not to mention um. Uh, Mandy Rose's injury is legit. Yeah. Uh, I know both um, uh, FOW Online and PW Insider. They both independently confirmed uh, that she's uh, her she the injury happened on the uh, the 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 November 9th edition of Raw. Like I guess she got yeah. like tangled up in the ropes or something like that. So they had to write her off TV. So you know, hopefully she gets you know she gets better. But yeah, I'm I'm, I'm with you on the Peyton Royce thing. I'm like, why would they split her from Billy Kay? Like I, yeah. I feel like they they didn't even begin to hit the like the peak of what they could do as a team. Like even though they won the tag titles at Mania, I still feel like they had a lot a lot more to go. And uh, you know, as far as SmackDown, um, man, I'm I'm telling you, if, if Bianca Belair isn't champion by I, I would say SummerSlam next year, they are asleep. 
I'm seven. They got sleep. <laughs> like, like, is the, that? Let, let me ask you this: Is that the like the the WrestleMania match for Sasha? Like, do you think, oh, or do you think it's Sasha? I here's what I, I'll say: I think it's. I don't know if they go back to Bailey and Sasha. I, I don't know if they go back to it to there, but I feel like it's either got to be Sasha versus Bianca or Sasha versus Rhea Ripley. Like, I feel like those are the mm. two best options, maybe on that. Yeah, no, you, I, I think you can hit on either of those. Like, and then you can always with Sasha and Rhea, you can always harken back to, uh, you know, Rhea, Rhea beat her. Yeah. At the, at the Survivor Series last year and pinned her, and then she beat her on SmackDown one time, so she beat Charlotte on SmackDown. But yeah. she beat both of them. Actually, I think that was. But um, yeah, I, I think you could go either one of those. But I, man, I'm telling you, Bianca Bianca Belair is like, is like a creative superstar. I'm telling you, like she got it all. <laughs> I'm telling you, dude, she got it all. Like I'm she saying, does. she got the look. She can wrestle. She like athletic as all hell. Like I'm telling you, and then you can. She's marketable, like very marketable. Like you know how many kids are gonna want that little braid. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like I mean, like that. That stuff is marketable, man. Like you can promote her into to to on, on to many outlets. And I think she's just like the. She she. she I, I think she's probably gonna be that person that they that they slap like right like right there in between. Like maybe. May, like may, maybe a Charlotte, maybe a Sasha, maybe a bit like they she kind of yeah. get slatted in like right there between them. I think she like she, she got it all, man. So it, it, it's gonna be interesting to see what they're gonna do. But I think I think maybe maybe they'll go uh, Sasha Rhea at Mania, and then they'll go Bianca Sasha at yeah. SummerSlam next year. But I mean at the same time, who who's to say Liv Morgan might not come up? Because Liv Morgan has a very endearing fan base. She has a big fan yeah. base, and you know they have the uh, the network documentary coming up about her um and and i'm pretty sure they just don't do that for anybody live they, they <laughs> literally been filming that since she debuted what was that 2017 yeah so they, they, they've been filming her since 2017 like who was like who, who you know wwe is doing that for like they, they got the <laughs> 365 but Liv morgan has a documentary coming out that she began to film since 2017 you know what i'm saying so obviously they have plans for her like it's, it's no way that they don't have plans for her and they doing stuff like that so you know, I'm I'm, I'm into red. like SmackDown got a solid women's division, man. Like I, I think they're gonna be set, you know, for you know for the next couple of months and you know heading like even past WrestleMania. Then we, you know, you you can always fact in. Uh, wait, is did they did, did Becky Lynch ever get put on a brand or they is she just kind of like whatever right now? Because I know Charlotte's on Raw. Yeah, I was trying to think. I don't think so. I feel like she's probably just sort of they probably left it like that intentionally would be my guess. So right, yeah. and, and you, you would assume that you know. It being Fox, like why wouldn't you? you know? Oh yeah, right. Yeah. Well, yeah, but Blake, I did want to ask you, like, uh, what, what do you think about um, uh, the, the Thunderdome moving to uh, Tropicana Field, and you know them doing inside the baseball stadium? Yeah, I think that's interesting because it's. I mean, here's the thing: from their perspective, it it allows you more options. I think in terms of if you're gonna allow fans back in at some point. I yeah. feel like that's a better situation than it would be inside of that arena because, you know, drop can of field, you've got some options of what you can do there. Um, so, so I think for them it makes sense uh, because, look, I, I know, like, we know how this works. Like, there is no doubt in my mind that there are people, WWE officials, that are looking at AEW and saying, man, they have got these fans in this, like, they've been doing this for a while now. They've got this football mm-hmm. stadium atmosphere. It's just like – even though it's not full, like it's noticeable now. Like, yeah, I think that's what we have, we can say more than anything. It's like, it is very noticeable when you watch AEW that there are fans there. And I think with WWE, like the Thunderdome is one thing, but we've always said it, like you cannot replicate that live fan experience. And so I, I have no doubt that like they are trying as fast as they can to get people back in the stands. I will say this, Andrew, I think it happens as soon as the Royal Rumble would be. Yeah. Well, and look, hold on. Let me say this though. I say that, but you know, we also know what's going on and we see where the numbers are with all of the stuff right now. And you know, it is, it is going up uh, more often than not. And so I think that's something that will obviously be looked at, but I do think that has to be the goal for them to buy the Royal Rumble to have fans. Um, you know, do, do they rush it? Do they do it and probably shouldn't be doing it? I mean, that's probably the better <laughs> better way to phrase it, but I just feel like that's kind of their goal at this point, making that move. Yeah, because, as I say, Blake, can you imagine a Royal Rumble with no fans? Oh, like, I know. It's, it, like, it, 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 I'm not saying it's going to be a rough watch, but it's it's just not the same, like, the, the the people count down the the, the count down the clock yeah, and everybody right. pop, pop popping for the next person to come out like is like it like can you imagine like did you remember that moment when um when Keith Lee came out of the Rumble early <laughs> yeah. this year and, and and everybody was just amped up 
can you imagine if that would have happened if it was no fans in there? Like, it, I think it would have been cool, but like, it, it, it just would have never been the same, man. But like, yeah, I, I definitely think this is that this is their way to get fans back in the you know back back in front of their show. Because I mean, you can you know since it's a baseball stadium, you can just slap people in those upper decks, and you know you can kind of spread them out a little bit, and you can have like a you know you can have a decent amount of people. I know a what does AW have like. 500 yeah, I was gonna say 600 something. something like that yeah yeah it, it, it's up there they got a decent amount of people in it like you said it's it's so noticeable and it adds to the overall feel of their show yeah because it's like what if you know if you do this at the rumble this past year it's like you know edge returns like you don't get that pop. oh my good like you don't no, get the, no, even no, the no, drew don't even remind me, right dude. and like even don't the even drew thing me. like do we have drew mcintyre like where he's at right now if you don't get that at the rumble where he's throwing out brock like if he throws out brock to to no reaction like that. It's just, it's completely different. And so, uh, yeah, no, I'm with you. And that's why I just think that's, that's why they're making this move. I mean, obviously they're, they're probably somewhat being forced to find the next best place because you know, the NBA starting back and all that. But I said, just, I think it makes sense for them because they, again, I have no doubt that they want to try to get fans back in there as soon as possible. And maybe it happens even before the Royal Rumble. Like, I feel like they probably want to do a little bit of a trial run with stuff like that before a big show. So um, maybe, maybe they even try to do it sometime next month, but we'll see uh, on so, that. Well, I, I was like, so, so what do you think that means for, uh, for WrestleMania? Cause doesn't the baseball season start back up in March? And I yeah, know I Tampa Bay. Say, yeah. yeah. So I, I was like, so where does that, you know where, where where do they go for WrestleMania? Like I I, I know Dan where they're not going back to the performance center. <laughs> no, so I feel like they're so, in a holding yeah. pattern. Like I feel like they're gonna try to milk this thing as long as they can at one place, which is kind of what we've seen them do with the Thunderdome, like and at, at the Amway Center. Like I feel like they're gonna stay as long as they can there, and now they're gonna stay as long as they can at Tropicana. But now. And they're going to hope probably at that point, it's like, okay, well, maybe we have something that pushes these numbers down. We can go somewhere else to where we can hold it, you know, at a outside outdoor stadium. Like, I think that's the only scenario. Like, they're going to have to do it, which they, they've been doing WrestleMania anyways, but it's not like they're going to be putting, you know, 70,000 fans in there. They're just, they're going to have to do an outdoor setting of some sort, um, you know, knowing, looking at what the NFL is doing and all these other things. So, yeah, I mean that that's my guess is it's going to be somewhere and look, maybe they maybe they do go back to the original plan for this year and just go back to to Raymond James there in, in Tampa and and do it all over again and and hope that it works this time. So mm-hmm. Yeah, so we'll see. But uh yeah, there you go. We're going to pick um we're going to pick Team Smackdown. I, by the way, I think I'd be interested if Bailey is on this team. I think you do maybe a little bit of a, a Bianca Bailey sort of situation here and maybe get something brewing there. Um, maybe, maybe that's something you could do leading into the, to the women's rumble too. So, uh, we'll see, we'll see what happens there. Bobby Lashley versus Sami Zayn. Um, I mean, you know, the hurt business has kind of been doing their thing and Sammy, I think has been great since he's come back. Uh, yeah, I just think yeah. his, his character right now is just, uh, he's just doing such a great job. And, you know, I don't know, like a part of me thinks that he needs to win this match, but there's also a part of me that thinks that uh, Vince McMahon's going to send Bobby Lashley out here and just destroy Sammy. Um, but <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I Again, I think Sammy should win this, but I'm actually going to pick Lashley here just because, I don't know, we know Vince is making the final call, and for whatever reason, I, I just, I don't know, I feel like he's he wants Lashley to win this match. Now, you you want to know it, it's a tough one, man, because I think both of them have been built up really well as yeah. their respective champions. Like I, I really do think. The, it, can, 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 can we just talk about MVP real quick? Because <laughs> look, look, no, because seriously, but this man has been in WWE. He's been back since January. He's elevated Apollo, Ricochet, Ali, Cedric, Shelton, Bobby, yeah. and how many other dudes he's elevated. He tried to do something with Shane Thorne and um yeah. Brendan Vink, and, and and it was going kind kind of well. He's elevated eight people to another level since he's been back. Like I'm, t- I'm telling you, man, MVP is forever stamped in. I'm telling you, because he he is definitely one of the greats on the mic. Because it, it's crazy, like it, it's just crazy how his presence has literally made Bobby Lashley seem like a main eventer. Like it, it's crazy, because before that, Lashley Lashley was like I, I feel like everybody kind of viewed Lashley the same. Like it was like. He should be a world champion, but he kind of missing something, and it's not yeah. it's not clicking to be a world champion. But now it's like he's hitting on all cylinders, and it's because of MVP. So and, and it's crazy, man. And I feel like MVP is going to do the same thing with Cedric Alexander. But like on the same note, 
I think Sami Zayn has been excellent since he came back. <laughs> like, I feel like this is, I, I feel like Sami Zayn is being himself on TV. Like, yeah. and he's just having fun. You know, he's just talking trash. And I feel like this is like real, real solid work that Sami Zayn is doing. So it, it, it's a rough one, man, because when you, I, and that's another thing we talked about, like when you got, the, when you do these champion versus champion matches, you, it, it, it kind of comes to a weird spot when you built up both of these people very good yeah. and one of them got to lose. So, but I'm, I'm I'm thinking just because of Sammy's track record as far as like WWE kind of being inconsistent with him <laughs> as far as like what they, you know, what they want to do with him. I think he'll lose. And I think Bobby Lashley is, is going to win and they're gonna probably going to keep him strong and, you know, keep the overall feel of the hurt business uh, on the up and up. Yeah, I'm going to go with that, too. I just think having the hurt business there, it, I just feel like there's a dynamic there where Lashley probably gets to win. But I mean, really, and I said it a second ago, like. It's not that I think all four of these champion versus champion matches are going to be good matches. I just think it's, you know, the concept like we talked about earlier. It's just I think it leaves a little bit something to be desired when you have them all on the same show. And, you know, because it really makes none of them feel special, which the main event's going to feel special. But I just think it just having so many on one, that's just and we've talked about that before, just with WWE's sort of theme pay-per-views and, and kind of what they do sometimes. But all of these should be good. And speaking of that, let's talk about the New Day versus Street Profits. Um, this is a match I think people have wanted to see for a while in terms of just on this setting. Um, you know, maybe trying to create the next, you know, New Day versus Usos here and kind of maybe making this something they can they can have for the future just to have these two teams going back and forth with each other because of their similarities. Um, of course, in the most unique uh, title switch in history, they simply exchange championships uh, <laughs> draft. Um, so that was something. But, I mean, look, I, I think this is one where – you know, I feel like the Street Profits need this. To, they need to win this um, because, you know, this is sort of that next step for them. You know, the New Day has accomplished everything they've accomplished. Um, you know, it's Kofi and Xavier. And I think those two guys, as we've seen, just being two of the more selfless guys probably in the, the company right now in terms of just what they do on a week in and week out basis. I feel like the Street Profits need to win this to elevate them. Um, and again, I think this is going to be a really good match and it's one I'm really looking forward to. Yeah, I I think the Street Profits should definitely win. Like, I I don't think, I, like, honestly, I think New Day is just at that point in their careers where them losing doesn't hurt them yeah. in the slightest. Like, and and I think that's just a credit to them. They they're just like on that upper echelon of like, like I guess superstardom you could say in WWE. I think they've reached that point. And and I I, I like I mean it, it does nothing for them to beat the Street Profits. I don't think. Uh, but just add to you know them their, their resume as a tag team. But like I feel like the Street Profits would benefit so much from being from being new to and like the Street Profits really haven't done much no. since they you know been on SmackDown because like I don't think the, the WWE doesn't really have a tag team division. Like they got Cesaro <laughs> and Shinsuke. Yeah. They and break them all up. Like they they, just... they, they they break them all up and do the mixed tag team thing. But like you like you you kind of hear this and. You know, of, of course, it would be better if we heard it from the man himself. But I don't think that's a, I don't, well, I'm, you know, we might hear it in this uh, that Netflix <laughs> yes. documentary they're doing about Vince. <laughs> but um, like it is like you've heard these stories from like people that work closely with him. Like I, I've even heard it from Aaron Anderson. And he was just like, you know, Vince isn't a fan of tag team wrestling. Like he he views like, you know, two big singles guys getting together as a tag team more yeah. attractive opposed to two guys who are legit a tag team. And that's just his his viewpoint, you know. So I, I mean, may, maybe maybe one of these days he'll come around. But no, I ain't gonna say that. I don't think that's gonna happen. But uh, <laughs> but but, the, but yeah, I think the street probably should definitely uh, get the win over New Day. Yeah, I'm with you. Like you, you look back at some of the tag teams, um, you know, throughout the the hottest periods in WWE, and there are gonna be some that I I forget. But like you know, Edge and Orton, like they were never like they were always singles guys. But then you know, came a tag team. Like you even look back at like those teams with. I guess Angle and, and Benoit and like all of those teams like that who they just paired these guys together and, and made them, you know, tag team guys and, and they would prefer that over just your normal tag team. So, um, yeah, there's there's lots of examples of that. And it's just, I don't know, the tag team situation, you know, and that's again, when you compare it to, you know, other companies, of obviously AEW is the one people are going to talk about when you just compare the tag teams in terms of the depth of the division and all those other things and kind of what they focus on, they're, they're different focuses. And, and like you said, Vince, no surprise, he's always focused on just those big money matches, the singles matches and, and all that. But, um, I mean, we can even say that as an example for what he, he wants to do here with this main event. But before we get to this Survivor Series main event, let's talk about Asuka versus Sasha Banks. Uh, this, yes. is, this is one, you know, we've seen 
already, you know, recently, like we've seen this, um, you know, before, but still, I think it's it, a banger every time. Yeah, I was gonna say, like, it's, <laughs> it's still one you're gonna put down and say, I know we've seen it before, but it's one that we don't mind seeing. And you can't always say that, I think, with WWE in terms of, you know, them running some of these matches into the, into the ground, which, by the way, we just talked about the Street Profits. Again, we, we laughed last time. I think they faced, um, you know, Andrade and Angel Garza probably 50 times in the past six months, but, um, you know, it's just, it's one of those things where I think when you put Asuka and Sasha Banks in there because of their personalities and just the chemistry they have, you know, it's going to be good. Uh, this is a, you know, this is a tough one for me because I, I don't, I don't think they want Sasha to lose here. Um, and I almost wonder if, I don't want to say Asuka is the same as the New Day, but I do think Asuka in terms of her personality and what she's shown throughout this entire, you know, pandemic era here, like she's one too, that... That whole streak, like the the thing she had going like long time ago, like that's we're not at that point anymore where, you know, nah, she's just uh-uh. this complete dominant force that they present her as, um, you know, she's just a much more, you know, again, like very free flowing personality type. And that's why I think she could afford to lose this match. Whereas I think with Sasha just winning this feud against Bailey and kind of just starting a new here as she has here recently. I feel like Sasha needs this more than Asuka, uh, but I also, you know, I, I always hate seeing Asuka lose because I remember back to, like, just how dominant she was during that run, but I, I almost feel like, okay, I know they're never going to get back to that point to where she's going to, you know, be on this Goldberg streak or anything like that, but, <laughs> uh, it, it, you know, I, 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 that's why I think in this one, I think Sasha needs this probably more than Asuka does. Yeah, no, nah, I, I I agree with you on that front, but like the the thing is with Oscar, like, and I don't know if I'm off here, but I feel like WWE views her as a really great hand. Yeah, like I feel I feel like that's how they kind of view Oscar. Like they can rely on her to hold the title and people to take her seriously, but I feel like Oscar has always been used as a placeholder champion in a way. Yeah, like they've been like whenever they don't have a plan, they just go to Oscar. And they'd be like, oh, yeah, we can put a title on her. Because, cause, I mean, of, of course they probably didn't expect, you know, Becky Lynch to, you know, be having this time off right now. Uh, so they, you know, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, the, you know, the obvious choice was just yeah, Oscar. Right. Like, you got to roll with Oscar. And then even when you look back at, um, when, when was that? Uh, T, when, that was that TLC 2018? I think that's when, right. I, yeah, when, when Oscar won the, the triple threat match between Becky and Charlotte. It was just like she was kind of a placeholder champion in a way because at the end of the show, who was standing tall? Ronda Rousey. You <laughs> yeah. know what I'm saying? And, and then at the, and then when they got to WrestleMania, Oscar was supposed to have the match against Sonya Deville. They took the title off her yeah. like just like that and put it on Charlotte. So and and, and it just seems like Oscar has always been kind of that you know, you know, just a a filler champion even though she is legit probably one of the top probably I would say top top 10 wrestlers in the company overall like she's she's really that good and you could say the exact same thing about sasha banks but i i feel like now they're fully invested in sasha that that's what i feel i feel like now they about to go all the way with her like it's it's gonna be no stop and start like no take the title off for the week after you know i feel like they about to go fully invested in it so yeah i definitely think sasha is gonna get the win right here because i mean like when you look at it oscar hasn't really done anything like i think yeah. the last time she was like really featured on raw was when she had that match uh, against Mickey James, that one Mickey broke her nose in, and like um, yeah, I feel like that's like that. That was probably like the last time she was like really featured. And that was like in September, so yeah. I mean, I I, I think Sasha should get the win here. And like, I mean, it, it, it's kind of the you know kind of the same thing we had, like you just mentioned with New Day. Like, I, I I don't think it's gonna hurt Oscar at all. And I mean, you can always just build her back up by you know putting her over with Peyton Royce or you know Lacey Evans or somebody like that. <laughs> And I think the problem for Asuka is that there's no big match waiting for her at this very moment. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, I feel like the only big matches for her would be Becky or Charlotte at this Charlotte, point. Charlotte, yeah. You know, and that's what I think. Like, I feel like, but but those are holding patterns. Like, those are not matches that are going to happen within the next month, probably. And so it's like, you know, uh, the the best option probably is to go to Asuka versus Shayna Baszler. But, like, again, I don't think that feels as big as, as a, you know, Asuka versus Charlotte again, or even, obviously, Asuka versus Becky just would not be big. So, I think having Sasha win this, knowing that she's probably building towards the bigger women's matches, um, you know, at the Rumble, probably at WrestleMania, I just feel like that that probably makes more sense here, too. So, um, yeah. So, I'm going to go with Sasha in that one. And uh, SmackDown doing, doing a pretty good job here. And we'll see 
if they are going to get another one in the main event because it is going to be Roman Reigns versus Drew McIntyre, champion versus champion. Uh, you talk about a weird and winding way to get here. Uh, we got here. <laughs> um, it was, again, I I mean, I, it was weird, though, like even to think about it. Like it was very weird to see that Survivor Series graphic and see Roman Reigns versus Randy Orton. And, and I've talked about this, you know, in the past couple episodes of podcast. It's like, I don't know what they do there. Like, where do they, how do they possibly do that match, given what both characters are at? I just, I thought it would have been a complete failure in terms of probably putting Roman in a situation he did not need to be in, given where the character was at. But now, like, this feels like the perfect situation. Um, You can complain all you want about, you know, maybe the way that they got here with Drew and, and why did he lose the title, you know, to Orton and all this other stuff. But, the fact is we got here, and obviously this is a much bigger and better match uh, than Reigns versus Orton would have been. Um, There's just, man, I tell you, Andrew, I I think about it in terms of these just big men's matches that we've had in WWE here recently. I will give them credit. Like, they have, like, they have built these two up to the point to where this feels like a big match. Like, this is a big, yeah, big does. match. And I can't say that, you know, they have, that's been one of their weaknesses, I think, over the years. And really, you know, how many years now? Like, they have not done a great job of building up these just mega singles matches that have not involved, you know, Brock Lesnar or some of the other, like The Undertaker or the guys of the past. But, like, these are two current guys, and this feels like a big match, and it's not WrestleMania. Like, they've managed to do this in a setting that's not WrestleMania. So I think you have to give them a lot of credit for that because... It does. Like, I am really looking forward to this, and I think this will more than deliver. Uh, I'm hoping, and I always say this with a caveat when it comes to WWE, I'm really hoping we get some type of clean finish here, and this is not just a complete, you know, schmoz where everything just comes running in and um, you just have chaos. I hope we actually get something here, and I'll tell you, I think the way to do it is to have Roman win this match, and then I think you go to the rematch at WrestleMania, and then you have Drew win that one. Maybe, again, I don't know how it works from a championship standpoint, Um, whether, you know, they decide whatever they decide. If they don't do Roman versus Rock, which, again, that's far-fetched probably at this point. Um, Roman versus Big E, maybe, if they can build Big E up. But as we've seen, like, what what have they done with Big E here recently? Like, it's almost like they forgot about him. Um, So I I think that's the way to go. I'm going to pick Roman here because I think – the money, as we always say, is in the chase. Uh, but either way, like I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah, I, I, I feel like Roman and Drew are probably one, like one and two, and you can slide them either way you pick. As far as like in the men's division, I feel like they they are like far beyond like everybody else as far as like popularity goes, and like the, the, just the, like the complete 180 that both that both of them are at from where they were at mania 35 when they had their matches so different like roman was kind of i I feel like roman had like a lot of fan support you know especially coming back from what he came back from i feel like a lot of people were just behind roman and drew was kind of like in that spot where like he was kind of always in these six-man tag teams like with lashley and corbin and it was just like he was just another dude and like to see where he is now and see how like much personality he has now, and I like they're building them up. Like Drew McIntyre is the man, yeah. and so is Roman Reigns. So like I, I feel like this is a, this is kind of another good thing, like how we talked about with Lashley and and Sammy. But it's kind it's a negative and a positive because you got two guys built them up so well, and now you got to get to a point where somebody got to take an L, you know, so somebody <laughs> got to lose. And look, the the only way I think so, I think one of two things, right? Number one, I'm gonna just throw this out there, and this is just a possibility. Maybe Brock Lesnar's coming back. Yep. You never know. Maybe he's coming back. You never know. He might show up. Might call to DQ. Like I, I know people probably gonna be like, "Oh man, why is Brock destroying the match?" <laughs> Bro, I'm telling you, people people see Brock back. Ain't nobody gonna care no more about and that match. And it would make sense, right? Like yeah, because it, given exactly. the history, it would make sense in this setting. Yeah, exactly. It, it would make it per- make perfect sense. But like, I, you know what? I'm, I'm I'm gonna take a shot in the dark right here. I think Drew McIntyre should win. Mm. I'm telling you, I think Drew McIntyre should beat Roman Reigns. Why? Because I think Drew literally just won the title back, and I feel like yeah. him taking the L this quick is just like that's true. Like what's like what's the point? Like he literally just won the title back, and I feel like again Roman is at that level to where him losing it's like eh, you know. I I think it get like make him lose like a little bit of steam. But like I don't really think it's gonna hurt Roman at all by him taking the L to Drew McIntyre. Like I feel like it. it I feel like. Roman beating Drew doesn't do half as much yeah. of of what it does if, if if Drew can beat Roman. Like I feel like that would do just yeah. wonders for Drew McIntyre, and that man would be on the that next level stratosphere as far as uh 
like superstardom goes in in, in under WWE standards. And it's like, yeah, it's like I, I think Drew McIntyre should pick up the win, man. And I think the way you get out of that is, you know, maybe like the that following Friday, you just had Roman going to damn tirade, like he just <laughs> yeah. smashing everybody because he lost and he upset and he pissed off. And man, maybe he starts slapping around Jay Uso because he mad. You know what I'm saying? Like I think that's an easy way to get out of it. And then I mean, you can always like I I, I think where we're where we're headed at TLC is Brian versus Roman. Yeah, I think that's what we I think that's what we going. And I and and it, it's crazy because another one, I I think you agree with me on this. I, I don't think Daniel Bryan losing to anybody at this point is going to hurt him. Like, yeah. I think Daniel Bryan is untouchable. Like, I, I, I legit feel like he, he's untouchable as far as, like, him losing doesn't do anything to his character, like, at all. Like, we seen Daniel Bryan lose to Jey Uso. We seen him get pinned clean, pinned clean by Buddy Murphy, and, like, nobody complained. Everybody was like, oh, Daniel Bryan put the dude over. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, and, 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 and I think that's... You know, and, 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 and you know, I think that also kind of stems from what we know publicly that Daniel Bryan is sort of not not on the creative team, but he's like, you know, throwing out he he, he has say. Yeah, I think that's the safe thing to say. He has say on the creative team. And then everybody knows that he publicly pushed for Biggie and he publicly pushed for Kofi, him him to drop the title to Kofi. And I feel like that has built like a lot of goodwill up for Bryan, the more, more on top of what he already has. So it's just like I think people kind of view him as like this untouchable character, like everybody just likes Daniel Bryan. You know, so I, I feel like. Roman could easily get that back by beating Daniel Bryan at at, at TLC and, re, and retaining the title, but I think I think I think the best way to go is, is Drew McIntyre beating Roman Reigns. See, and I think the the biggest part of this, and and that's why I really enjoy this match because it's like there I can see both sides of it. Like it would make sense, I think, for both sides because the problem is it's all about where you're going, and if you're looking at WrestleMania, to me. If they do WrestleMania, and we talked about it earlier, and there are people in the stands, and let's say, I mean, if there are 500 people in the stands, maybe not. But if they're able to put, you know, thousands of people in there, and obviously we're not talking 50,000 or anything like that, but, I mean, you have to obviously consider a scenario where you either do Drew versus Brock or Roman versus Brock. Like, I feel like, you know, either of those matches, like, we know Vince. Like, he's going to make that call. Um, he's going to want Brock on the show, I'm sure. Uh, so mm -hmm. I feel like that's a scenario where maybe they find a way to go to one of those. Um, and then maybe that, that way, I think if Drew wins this match, like you could always kind of maybe force your way towards one of those. Um, but you know, it is, man, it's, it's an interesting thought on this because uh, there are lots of ways you could go. And, and that's why I think they've done so well with, with Roman is that, all of his matches have felt different in terms of the ones he's had since he's come back. And we're like, even the, the Jey Uso ones, like they felt different. And I feel like this is going to be another one. Like it's going to feel different in some way, shape or form. And that's because he's just that good right now. And, and of course, Drew, that's not to take anything away from him, but it's just, I don't know. Like this is going to be fascinating to see what they do with this one. And um, again, I, we, it's very easy to kind of knock WWE events and all this other stuff for a lot of things that are going on with that company. Um, you know, we don't even get into the Selena Vega thing. Like we could talk an hour about <laughs> that, but <laughs> at the same time, like, I feel like you have to, you have to find the positives where you can get them. And I think this is one of those where I will give them credit, like putting that championship match on TV. I thought that was a fresh thing to do. Um, even though, you know, you only have whatever six days to build to this, you had kind of built this up already the week before on SmackDown. Um, so I will give them credit for doing this because this was the one that this makes it feel like a big show because you have this main event and obviously we're going to get to take her in a second, but like, this is a big enough main event, I think, to carry a show like this. And this is one of your big four, whatever number of pay-per-views it is now each year. And, and this is one that, that feels like it's a special match. So, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that, man. Like, yeah, it, it can go either way, honestly. And I, I don't think people will be upset if Drew wins. I don't think people will be upset if Roman wins. Like, you can honestly go either way. And I don't think people will be upset if they see Brock back. Like I, I generally don't like, and I mean we 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 kind we kind of heading around that time, you know that road to WrestleMania kind of, <laughs> you know that season. I feel like we yeah, we we really all look. It's like I'm I'm pretty sure the TLC pay per view is gonna get announced on Sunday, uh, as far as the date goes. And then yeah, what what were we like? We like three weeks out from them moving to uh, Tropicana yeah. Field. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's, it's gonna be something, man. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I think it's going to be, yeah, uh, it's just going to be a lot of fun uh, with this one. And you mentioned kind of that road to WrestleMania. And 
the person that is uh, usually in that uh, has been in that spot over the past uh, several years. Hey, that or, transition. <laughs> what a transition, transition, right? <laughs> um, the Undertaker, and uh, we're going to wrap up here with a little bit of a little bit of fun rankings as we've done here on the previous couple podcasts. Uh, we've been throwing these in just for to have some fun discussion, but we're going to rank the Undertaker's top five opponents. Now, this is an interesting one, Andrew, because it's very subjective, of course. Um, and I will say, I I worded this top five opponents for a reason like if we did top five rivalries like that would be different to me because it would say okay these are the biggest rivals but i think just an opponent i'm looking at it as maybe matches and matches that i've enjoyed personally now again everyone's gonna have a different list and you both of our lists are probably gonna be a little bit different we may have the same people but i think it'll be different in terms of the ranking because these are all just subjective based on our enjoyment of some of his matches over the years but I, I look back at this and there were like there were more options on here than I thought there would be. Um, there are a couple guys I left off my list that I was thinking, man, I really want to find a way to put them on here. But I'm like, I only got five spots. And so I, I've got to narrow it down. So we're going to jump in. We're going to do what we did on the previous episode of the podcast here. We're going to count them down five to one. And again, I, I have a feeling we're going to have probably three or four even the same. Uh, but we'll just kind of talk about them as we go down. But Andrew, just guess. So you get the honor of going first and uh, your number five choice for uh, the top five Undertaker opponents. Oh, you put you gonna put me on the spot like that? You, <laughs> you put make me go first. But uh, no, no, number five, I'm gonna go. I'm probably gonna surprise some people with this one. I got an explanation. So I'm gonna go John Cena at number five. Ooh. That's what I'm gonna say. I'm gonna go John Cena at number five. And the reason I say that I'm not talking about the 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 28 what was that 2018. Yeah. 2018, Squash. I'm not talking about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about 2003, 2002, <laughs> when, when Undertaker was Big Dog and John Cena and John Cena. Like, he, he, he Big Dog in the first time they had that. I'm pretty sure everybody remember that clip when he gave John Cena a little <laughs> pat on the chest. And then the next year, John Cena was, like, in full force, like, on his way to becoming yeah. the John Cena that we all know. And I remember it was um, – it was at Vengeance 2003, I think it was, Undertaker and John Cena had that match. And, dog, the build to that was so great. Like, because John Cena was like, they, 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 you, could, you, could st- you could tell they were, they were kind of all in on John Cena at that point. Like, they were slowly building them up, you know, putting them in the U.S. title yeah. scene. And then he eventually went on to win a WWE title. But it's like, he, he, him having that feud with Undertaker, I feel like that did wonders for him. But even though he didn't beat the Undertaker at that time, it was like it, it did so much for him to even lose to the Undertaker. Like, and it was crazy because I, I'm, I'm like, it was specific, one, one specific promo that I remember. And I, I remember I used to have, I had this DVD. Um, <laughs> I, had, I had this DVD and I used to play this thing all the time when I was a kid, I'm still a kid in a way. But like, <laughs> so I, I remember I used, to, I, used to, I used to play this DVD all the time. And it was when, um, he, he cut this promo on the Undertaker, and I remember it verbatim. He was like, he was like, he was like, at vengeance. He's like, I'm approved that the big dog is all bark. He said, like, <laughs> right. And he was like, I'm gonna claim my territory, and I'm gonna piss right on the mark. Yep. And it, it, like when, when I initially heard that, I was like, well, that's cool. But like when you, when, like when you hear it when, as you get older, I'm like, oh, he meant Mark Calloway. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, I was like, so so like that that whole 2002 2003. John Cena, Undertaker thing that that that's what's gonna put John Cena at five for me. That's a good one because I think people remember just sort of the the current iteration of yeah. both of those guys, and they don't really remember kind of because they were different like back then, like they were completely different characters and kind of where they were at. Yeah. But yeah, that's a good one. Undertaker Honestly, was the, he was the biker character back then. Yeah, like he had he had kind of morphed into that, and no, that that's a good pick. Like that is one that I probably didn't have in my consideration, but it's honestly probably one that I probably just forgot about based on where those guys are at. Um, number five for me. Kind of similar but different, probably in that that sort of same era. Some sorts, probably several years later. But I'm gonna put Batista at number five. I think they mm. had some they had some really good matches, and I thought that their chemistry together was really good. Um, just based on, and again, like we're saying, this this is our personal enjoyment. Like I just enjoyed their matches. Like I enjoyed the build to their matches because I mean, you know, like it or not, like these are two hosses. Like these are just two huge guys um throwing them in the ring and both of them are so you know they can move so well or you know they could during their kind of height of their feud and i just thought they had some really fun matches now the problem was i put batista at number five and that forced me to leave two two others off of my list which i'll just go ahead and say it now like they're not going to be on here but like edge and kane were two that i had but i you know I, i thought about kane there, I just don't recall like any. There's none of those matches with Kane, and and of course they had a lot of them. But 
like they just weren't on that same level maybe with some of the others even with the story behind it and so i had a problem maybe yeah. slotting kane into this but like the ones he had with edge i think like even the edge stuff a little bit underrated like you mentioned the cena stuff i think the stuff he did with edge was underrated um and so that was kind of hard for me to leave edge off of here but i just decided that the batista stuff it just i don't know it just felt like during that smackdown sort of era um they, they were really good together so i'm gonna go batista at five which of course now leads us back to you for number four number four i am going to roll with triple h Ooh. at number four and I, I, I'm going to go with that for the obvious reasons. We, of course, saw that 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 great Hell in a Cell match that they had all those years ago when they did the whole, um, you know, fi- final battle thing on the stage with Shawn Michaels. And, yeah. you know, the the they, it, uh, what was that? Shawn Michaels losing to Undertaker kind of led to <laughs> Triple H challenging him. And, yeah. and, 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 you know, going going way back in time again, they, they worked with each other so early on in the 2000s, man. It had so many solid matchups. And then I remember the build to the King of the Ring 2002 when it was taker rock and uh triple h in that world title scene that undisputed title scene man yeah. and it was just like they they they, they like they, they just work so good together man and like i always felt like undertaker and triple h really bounce off each other because triple h has always been presented on screen as that kind of alpha male character but i don't think there was nobody that was presented alpha male as alpha male than the undertaker on screen so it's like it was always interesting to see that clash and like i, I don't think I don't think their, their their matches were always right. Like some they, like they, they weren't always bangers. Like I'm not saying it was nothing wrong, but I'm just saying I don't think they you know mashed up to like something like Sean or you know anything like that. But I always felt like just the 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 two characters being in there with each other and working with each other for the greater part of 15, 20 years. Like I always <laughs> felt like they always really played well off of each other. Yeah, and I was gonna say it feels like like Triple H and Undertaker's matches. Like the one thing that they had in common is they were always long. But like sometimes they <laughs> again they were better than others. But I will say I have Triple H number four on mine. So you pretty much just hey. uh, you just said it there. So I had him at number four too because uh, yeah, I, it's sort of the same reasoning, and, and that's the really probably don't even need to add a lot more to it. It's just I think that you know they had so many different kind of matches, and I think you know their characters also kind of just sort of evolved over the years and having different matches. Um, obviously there may be some more recent ones that people say, Oh, I'm not real sure about that. Or, uh, I think they had one was it King of the ring 2000. I don't know. I have to look back at it, but like they had yeah, one. Yeah, that, that, was, that was King of the ring 2002. Oof, yeah, yeah. That, that wasn't a, that, I mean, that was kind of interesting, but again, I think that, you know, they're just kind of, I don't know, they had good chemistry and I think they put themselves in good spots in terms of kind of where their characters were at the time. So yeah, that's why I had uh, triple H at number four uh, on that one. So, uh, all right, we go back to you then since that was my number four, back to you for number three. Number three. I think I might surprise people with this one. Uh Oh, I- I'm gonna go Kurt angle. Ooh, there number you three go. for the undertaker. And the reason I say that is because I feel like doing, especially during the year 2000, I feel like undertaker was working with Kurt doing and 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 that's and I truly mean when I say this I don't think any wrestler has had a better year than Kurt Angle did in 2000 cuz he was just over like I like I like I can I can't even remember that like I mean of course you remember that time somebody was that over but I'm thinking like just Kurt, Kurt Angle was so over back then man and he was so new and like the the whole like and I think it it was just him being like him being presented as a heel and then like people naturally gravitating to him as a baby face like i feel like that was just like one of the better transitions in, in that wwe has successfully done as far as like turning somebody heel to baby face so trying to present them as a heel and the crowd just naturally gravitating to him but undertaker working with kurt for like that period of time during 2000 and of course in the years forward like he um i, I think we all like, I, mem- I remember kurt beat undertaker clean at survivor series 2000 that year and then uh i think we all remember that match that they had the triple threat with him rock um and, and take at, at the what was that vengeance oh two i think that yeah. was yeah triple threat yeah, I, that I think, was awesome yeah yeah. It, yeah really that was a really great match and then um it, it, we, we can we can even go back to um what, what, what was that 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 few they had on smackdown what was that 2008 yeah 2008 right when they, they had that thing and i think that was like <laughs> I, I think that was like probably one of the more more interesting clashes of characters, like because they were so different. Like, of course, Undertaker is Undertaker, but I think Kurt Angle was just on this like wrestling machine type, you know, thing when he had the mouthpiece and he had revamped his interest so people could stop saying you suck. And like, it, I, I think Kurt Angle was just hitting on all cylinders 
back then as far as character goes and of course in ring work like i don't think i think that goes you know they don't need to mention that but like i feel like kurt angle is probably one of the more underrated opponents of the undertaker and they they've always had like great interactions and you know even great backstage segments together so like from the ones that they did like so yeah I, i'm gonna go i'm gonna go with kurt angle at number three he's the that's the one i had on my short list too with edge and kane um and there was somebody else i had on there but i can't remember who the other one i was thinking of i'm sure i'll think of it in a minute but like that was the one too i was thinking about. i was like man like they didn't just have those good matches like in the early 2000s but like they wound up having some good ones like in the later part of the 2000s yeah. like too and it was um yeah those are the ones that i think people just sort of forget about sometimes because I mean, you know, it's just, man, we've, we've seen so much wrestling and sometimes so it's, much. Just, it's just like, man, you just like, even that sort of, for me, I think during that stretch from like, oh, eight to, I want to say like even probably 11, maybe it's just like, man, some of that stuff gets a little it's, scattered. It's blanked out, man. Yeah. And it's, it's just, <laughs> it gets scattered sometimes. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that's one too, that certainly, I mean, Kurt Angle, we, I mean, he's one of my favorites. Everybody knows that, but like he he can work with anyone, and I think that was just another example in terms of uh, him working with Taker. So that that's a good choice, I think. Number three, uh, my number three, I'm going to go with Angle's uh, counterpart there in his career, and that is Brock Lesnar. Um, mm. I think Brock, and you know, it's another one sort of similar to Batista in that you know they just I don't know there was something about just these two guys and their style to where having the Undertaker versus Brock. Like I remember back like in the 2002 when you know Taker was sort of starting to you know brock was making his rise of course you know wins the title and then you had you know i think it was unforgiven and then they had the hell in the cell at no mercy um you know just i mean these two guys i mean they're they're icons they're legends and i think anytime you know you put them in the ring together and of course we could even you know talk about wrestlemania 30 and sort of the streak there and obviously not a match overall that people are going to remember and say it's one of the greatest matches ever but it's certainly one of the most important matches ever um in terms of kind of how things unfolded there so i'm gonna go with brock at number three i just think that it's um you know it's an interesting one i think overall just to think about sort of you know the the history between those two and I don't know. I just always enjoy their work together. So I'm going to go Brock at number three, and uh, that leads us back to you at number two. So number two, I don't think it's no surprise here uh, <laughs> who I'm about to pick. I'm going to go with Mick Foley. All right, so let's and just go ahead and two, say I, now, like we're we're going to have the same two and one because I there's yeah. no doubt. Like, so, 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 yeah. so, so you're you going you to make a Sean? <laughs> yeah, like that's going to be it. So let's yeah. just, we can just discuss them both together because we're both, uh, That's I think it's the most obvious choice really because when we think yeah. about it, like the gap between one, two, or one and two, and then number three, I think is a, a pretty big gap based on the history and the matches with these two guys. Yeah, no, no, no doubt. But uh, like, I, I think, uh, of, of course, when we first think about Sean, the, the, the first thing people think about is that Mania 25 <laughs> match when they tore the, tore the damn house down. Yeah. Like, I, I think that was probably like one of the best Mania matches of all time for sure. Um, and, and of course, Mick Foley, like, I think that, you know, I think that goes without saying, honestly, like, just, just, just if, if you dump everything else that they done and you just leave that Hell in a Cell match they had, I think they'd still be, Mick Foley would still be number two, oh, honestly, because yeah. yeah. like that, that, I, I, I really feel like they set a bar that has yet to be even remotely touched as far as Hell in a Cell matches goes, because like, I feel like when, when they did what they did, it's like now with Hell in a Cell matches, it's like everybody is just waiting for the bump instead of the match. Like everybody's like, okay, well, who's who, who's falling off the cell? No. Who's jumping off the cell? Like I, I feel like that's kind of the thing. Like, but when Undertaker and Mankind did that, I feel like they just set the bar so high, and pro- pro- probably probably to a you know a negative point because man, I, I don't you know it, it was a couple points there. I don't think Mick Foley was probably gonna be getting up like no. if you know like so, so it, it, it was some you know some points there if he'd have landed certain alerting a certain landed a certain way or like a couple degrees to the right or to the left like it, and Mick Mick Mick, Mick would have been you know he'd have been in some trouble but um you know thankfully he, he's all he's all set and it's all good but like I feel like Foley and Sean being Foley being number two and Sean being number one is kind of the you know the obvious ones, and and and, and of course, and like you know, as we kind of gain more knowledge about the the inside of the business, it's like the 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 Undertaker Sean dynamic is more interesting because I I, I think Undertaker and, and 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 Mick have always been cool, but Undertaker is openly, and we've heard these interviews over the past couple of years. Sean Michaels and Undertaker weren't friends yeah. back in the day; <laughs> they didn't like each other. You know what I'm saying? That's just what it, they they weren't friends. They didn't like each other, and and you even heard the story. From Undertaker himself, and he and Sean told the story like Undertaker was like, um, 
I, I guess they were waiting for Sean to drop the belt to Steve Austin at Mania 14, and <laughs> Sean was supposed to take some time off and Undertaker didn't know if Sean was going to do business because Sean because Sean was Sean back in the day. Yeah. And they didn't know they didn't know what he was going to do. So Undertaker <laughs> was like sitting backstage and he was you know he had his hands taped up. He was ready to fight him in case he didn't do business. <laughs> and, and and the funny thing was Undertaker told this story recently and he was just like Sean Michaels had asked him like years later like way, way like years later and was like. Um, were, were, were you really gonna beat me up after Mania 14? <laughs> and, and Undertaker was like, "Nah, man, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't do such a thing to you." And Undertaker was like, "In his head, he was like, bro, I was gonna smash yeah. you. <laughs> if, if, like, like if, 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 if you didn't do business, I was going to smash you. Like, soon as you got backstage, and and it's crazy because like they had so many good matches together, yeah. but they did not like each other. That is crazy. <laughs> like they like when you think about what was that um." What was that match, Blake? The uh, the in your house match when oh, Shawn yeah. Michael, when Shawn Michael, when he punched him and Shawn Michael did the whole flip thing down, <laughs> yes. down, down, down the stage, uh, and then uh, of course they got the, the Hell in a Cell match with Kane debut. That was a good match overall, even without the Kane debut, it was a good match. Um, like they 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 like I think they I think every Shawn Michaels and Undertaker match has been really really good, minus the um. That 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 garbage they put on that crown jewel. I don't know what the yeah, hell they was thinking. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. We we talk about selective memory. Like that's that's <laughs> one I've completely forgot about. So um, no, I, I'm with you. I think you said it. I mean, it's just there's been. I mean, you talk about chemistry all time between two guys. I think most people, you know, you're probably gonna put like Flair and Steamboat up there. You're gonna put um, you know Rock and Austin up there and. I think you got to put this one up there just in terms of how those two guys work together, like you said, and just amazing, just given their personal, you know, relationship with them, a lot of that. And just uh, for them to, to do what they did, is, it's pretty remarkable. So I uh, would highly recommend if you want to go back, you feel a little, you know, nostalgic and listening to this podcast uh, over the weekend <laughs> before Survivor Series uh, or even after, even if you're listening to this after Survivor Series, um, Go back and watch some of these these Taker Sean Taker Mankind or really any of these people we mentioned um, because that there are there are so many that that are you know through the archives there you go back and watch there's just a lot of good matches and like I said we we could have added we could have made this top ten list and it probably still would have been difficult because um, you know Taker was Taker and, and he certainly had some good matches over the years for sure but Andrew well we we set out to do this in like 45 minutes uh, we wound up going over but you know what that's okay I always enjoy a good discussion and you and I could could talk rest for hours but uh we'll let people get back to what they you know want to do and, and catch up on some of these undertaker matches and get ready to watch survivor series but uh as always uh you've got a lot going on we talked about it earlier uh you've also got uh, the new podcast which i was uh laughing about before we came on uh, you have uh the bushby and, and thompson's wrestling adventure which i will say on the record i think has one of the best podcast art in the history of uh, podcasts <laughs> it's just uh, one of the coolest there is but uh let everybody know where they can find all the great stuff you have going on right now yeah so you can uh, catch all my written work of course at postwrestling.com uh I'm 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 on be on the news before for for quite a while, man. So I'm I'm looking forward to uh, to to taking that load on, and um, uh, of course all my interviews on the Andrew Thompson interviews YouTube channel. I'll have some new up uh, next week as well. Um, and and of course you check out the the Bush and Thompson's Wrestling Adventure podcast also on Post Wrestling and on other uh, podcast feeds as well. Uh, my good man Martin Bush, uh, one of the coolest dudes <laughs> out there. So yeah, man, uh, that, that's that's where you can find me, and you can find me on Twitter at um ad thompson underscore underscore. Yep, we'll put all that in the show notes. Uh, everybody, check out uh, all of Andrew's stuff. And uh, Andrew, like I said, man, this is always always fun to catch up. Uh, we will do it again here soon. And uh, thanks as always for coming on. Uh, no problem, Blake. Hey, Blake, thank you for having me on, man. It's always a good time, and we 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 two for two for two on these great podcasts, <laughs> man. We might have to start getting in business. I, I don't I don't know what's going on, Blake, but. We, we might have to start talking about doing something, brother. Listen, man, we got some ideas. I got some ideas in my head right now. So uh, if you if you hear us in your your earbuds over the next uh, several months, just say this was this is where it started right here. So <laughs> thanks, Andrew. Peace. Thanks again to Andrew Thompson for joining us here on the 411 on Wrestling Podcast. As mentioned, be sure to check out all of Andrew's work over at Post Wrestling in addition to the great podcast that he has going on uh, and his Andrew Thompson's interviews channel. Um, so check all those out. We'll have the links to them in the show notes. And for everything else, uh, be sure to check out 411mania.com. Uh, we'll have coverage of Survivor Series on Sunday. We'll have live coverage. Uh, we'll have reviews. We'll have all sorts of stuff. You can check out a preview. Uh, Jeremy Thomas will have his preview up as well. 
uh, before the show. So lots of great stuff over at 411 Mania to keep you up to date on everything Survivor Series. But also, you can stay up to date on everything else going on in the world of wrestling uh, with our weekly reviews, weekly columns, and uh, everything else uh, that you can find over at 411 Mania. And as always, we'll have the link to uh, the GoFundMe for Larry Zonka's family in the show notes. Uh, so please continue to share that if you can. And uh, again, for everything else, uh, be sure to subscribe to the podcast. Um, you can find that on any podcast app you use. Just search for 411 on Wrestling, uh, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever. You can find it on there. And if you enjoy the show, uh, do us a favor. Leave us a nice five-star rating or review. Uh, that just helps the show reach more people. And uh, for everything else, you can find me on Twitter at WrestleBlake. Thanks, as always, for listening to the podcast. Stay safe, and we'll talk to you next time here on the 411 on Wrestling Podcast. 